Crassus, now responsible for leading the efforts against Spartacus, took over as Praetor and started the necessary remodeling to achieve victory. He appointed six new legions, as well as the two consular legions of Gallius and Publius Lentulus, to be reorganized and prepared. It should be pointed out that he was very successful and quickly managed to gather between 32,000 and 48,000 infantry troops, plus auxiliaries, into his army. But Crassus was not stopping there. He passionately believed that Rome's earlier defeats were not only caused by the weak leadership of the commanders, but also by the soldiers' indiscipline and inexperience. Based on these insights, Crassus resorted to harsh treatment of his commanders. In many cases, he was downright brutal by ordering the reinstatement of an ancient punishment called decimation. The word decimation comes from Latin and means removal of a tenth. It was a form of Roman military discipline where every tenth man in a group was put to death. Roman army commanders used discipline to sanction units or large groups guilty of capital crimes such as cowardice, mutiny, desertion, and insubordination, as well as being used to appease rebellious legions. These punishments had the desired effect, to the extent that the historian Appian states that Crassus was viewed by his men in a more fearful fashion than a defeat at the hands of an enemy. Once everything was ready, the moment was ripe for action. Spartacus decided to retreat and set up camp in the south. Soon he found himself surrounded by merchants trying to retrieve the goods looted by his troops. Spartacus quickly wanted to flee Italy, and the situation became even more urgent when Crassus's army raided and massacred an isolated group of around 10,000 rebellious slaves. Having learned that Spartacus and his troops were in southern Italy, Crassus stationed six of his legions on the region's borders and assigned his ally Lucius Mummius with two legions to maneuver behind Spartacus. Plutarch tells us in his writings that Spartacus made a deal with pirates to take him and around 2,000 of his men to Sicily, where he planned to ignite a slave revolt and gather reinforcements. But he was betrayed by the pirates, who took the payment and then abandoned the rebels. It is reported that this stirred up a major disturbance among Spartacus's troops. They reportedly tried to build rafts or makeshift ships to attempt to escape but Crassus undertook unspecified measures to guarantee that the rebels would not cross into Sicily, causing Spartacus to give up his escape attempt. Crassus then made his army move with speed, building a system of ditches and walls 60 kilometers long that ended up imprisoning Spartacus, now with dams in front and the sea behind him, which made movement virtually impossible. As a result, Mummius, instructed not to engage Spartacus's men, felt confident and decided to advance, as he believed he had spotted a wonderful opportunity. But he failed and was defeated. After this loss, Crassus turned out to be more competent than Mummius and achieved a few successes in certain battles where he decimated more than 6,000 warriors commanded by Spartacus without achieving a decisive victory. He forced Spartacus and his men to move south through Lucania while Crassus gained more ground. The rebels were now under siege and running out of supplies. During this stage, Spartacus's troops were once again torn apart, perhaps due to disagreements between those who wanted to continue plundering and those who were looking for an escape from Italy. There may also have been ethnic tensions between the distinct groups following Spartacus, with most of those who split being Gauls. Crassus attacked these breakaway strongholds and managed to wipe out around 30,000 men. He could have inflicted more casualties had it not been for Spartacus's intervention. During this battle, the Romans recovered the eagles that had been lost to the slaves during previous clashes. Watching the situation, Spartacus appeared to have been planning to take his army back to the Alps, as they encountered little resistance from that direction. But Crassus soon realized that he did not need to rush after them, as the slave army had turned around and was ready to fight a battle. But then a surprising event occurred. The Roman Senate, displeased with Crassus, considering that he was not moving fast enough. This disgruntlement began to grow as Sextus Pompey had just come back from his raids in Hispania. Capitalizing on this coincidence, the Senate promptly ordered Pompey's forces to head south to assist Crassus. 
but the latter was deeply concerned, as he believed that Pompey would steal his glory. He therefore ordered his troops to move at full pace to defeat Spartacus as quickly as possible, to prevent Pompey from meddling in the fighting. Amid all this struggle for power and glory, Spartacus spotted an opportunity to take some kind of advantage. He strategically decided to bargain with Crassus, believing that he would agree to his terms for fear of losing his position to Pompey. But his strategy was fruitless, as Crassus rebuffed it. The crucial moment had come. Spartacus knew it. He commanded his troops to assemble and decided to carry out a symbolic act. According to Plutarch, he ordered his horse to be brought. In a move which surprised all men, Spartacus killed the animal. He then stated that, if he were to triumph that day, he would have plenty of horses from the defeated Romans to choose from. On the other hand, he said that if he were defeated, he would not need any horses. Spartacus ordered his men to charge with fierceness against the Romans in what were initially extraordinarily successful actions. His troops succeeded in killing several Roman guards and penetrating the Roman defenses. Spartacus and around 50,000 rebels managed to break through Crassus's defenses, threatening the Roman leader's position. Along the banks of the river Sel, Spartacus's army finally met Crassus's Roman legions on the open battlefield. The end was near. The former gladiators then charged into the Roman ranks, slamming into a wall of shields and swords. While the rebels fought hard and took down many Roman soldiers, they also sustained heavy casualties in the process. Spartacus gathered his troops and led an advance against Crassus. Several of Crassus's troops had been destroyed. Hoping for a direct confrontation with the Roman leader, Spartacus pushed forward frantically to meet him within all the chaos taking place on the battlefield. He even slew two centurions in his search for Crassus, but by then, Spartacus's triumph was impossible. Although his men were brave, they were not a professionally trained and well-prepared army, which made defeating an immense and highly qualified force like Crassus's virtually unfeasible. According to the historian Appian, he was injured in his leg by a spear, but fell to one knee and held his shield in front of him, unwilling to give up the fight. Then his men began to desert, sensing imminent defeat. The brave Spartacus was surrounded by Roman legionnaires. Wounded and facing certain death, he chose to fight until his last breath, before dropping dead on the battlefield. Spartacus's final vicious attack drew the Romans' reluctant admiration. Even Publius Florus, who usually considered Spartacus and his followers to be verging on savage, admitted that on this final occasion, they died like men, fighting to the end, as one would expect from those led by a gladiator. Spartacus himself died in a way befitting a leader, courageously fighting in the front line. Near the end, with victory all but assured, Pompey's troops finally appeared and quickly defeated the remaining warriors, capturing several other deserters. 6,000 survivors of Spartacus's army were then crucified along the Appian Way from Rome to Capua, and their bodies laid to rot there for years as a warning against future insurrections. But Spartacus's body was gone. Oddly enough, even though enemies surrounded him when he died, the Romans could not find his body after the battle. The Romans wanted to display the corpse to deter those who hoped Spartacus would survive and return. This attempt would perhaps have prevented him from becoming the legend he eventually became. Following this, much to Crassus's misfortune, Pompey sent a direct message to the Senate, declaring that he had been the main culprit in the victory over Spartacus. This message was well received and Pompey got most of the glory, bringing to fruition Crassus's initial fears. Pompey and Crassus later enjoyed political benefits for having suppressed the rebellion, with both returning to Rome with their legions. In a move that illustrated how powerful they were, they refused to dispense with their troops, ordering them to camp outside Rome. They were elected consuls in 70 BC, partly due to the implied threat of their armed legions camping outside the city. The end of the Third Roman Servile War, directly and indirectly, ultimately benefited the slaves in the medium and long term. In the following decades, new laws and regulations started to be enacted, allowing the lives of these people to become a little less painful, and making them remember Spartacus, 
the slave and gladiator who defied Rome. He ended up going down in history as one of the greatest warriors of all time. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like it and subscribe to our channel.